so welcome everyone. After I hope everyone had a nice uh, long lunch break. Uh, so and is ready to get serious right now. <laughs> so uh, this uh, ev everything I'll be talking about uh, in this talk is based on joint work with uh, Quentin Conley, Damien Gaborio, and Andrew Marks, all uh, who are all here this week. Uh, <clears throat> And this title slide, you don't actually have to memorize it. And in fact, it's not, <laughs> doesn't have that much, to, it's not very essential to the talk. I just I spent a lot of time on this title slide uh, for an <laughs> another talk, and I thought it was such a waste to just uh, to not use it again. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, to be honest, when I was making this slide, I was busy writing a grant proposal. So this is like, <laughs> explaining all of the, <laughs> yeah, Mikos knows what I'm talking about. So, uh, all right, so I'll, I'll begin. I mean, everything I'll be talking about is really more, uh, if, I mean, if you're reading here, everything will be in this measured group theory, ah, this is working, measured group theory area on this, on this top. There. So, all right, so let's, let's begin. So the setting uh, that I'll be working is in is that R uh, will denote a probability measure preserving a countable Borel equivalence relation on a standard probability space x mu. And actually, okay, throughout the slides I'll always say PMP, but in fact, everywhere except for one place, uh, we don't, which I will point out, uh, we actually won't need to use the PMP uh, <coughs> assumption uh, for, um, for, the, for the main results. Uh, so people, uh, I mean, you seem like a very uh, Forward-thinking audience, and I know you're 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 happy. I mean, especially after Jan's talk, we're all we're all prepared to uh, think also about measure class preserving uh, actions and equivalence relations. So here, saying that R is a is a probability measure preserving countable Borel equivalence relation just means one one way to it's equivalent to saying that it's an orbit equivalence relation of a probability measure preserving action of some countable group. So you can. Uh, and in fact, yeah, so that's equivalent. Uh, so first definition, a graphing of R uh, is a Borel graph G on X, uh, whose connected components are precisely the R classes. All right, so uh, then a treeing of R is just a graphing with no cycles. So it'll equip every, in this, in this measurable way, where we equip every equivalence class, R equivalence class with the structure of a tree. All right, so the, one of the main examples is you start with your equivalence relation coming from a probability measure preserving action of some, uh, of some group gamma, and you, suppose you have a favorite generating set, S for gamma, uh, and then we can obtain a graphing, I'll we'll call it G sub S, where we just connect two points uh, by an edge, two points are adjacent, if uh, they differ by a generator, and if we don't want loops, then we'll say also that they're not equal. So this is G sub S. And since S generates gamma, uh, we actually do indeed get a graphing. The connected components here are precisely the orbits. And uh, here I'm just establishing some notation that R gamma is this orbit equivalence relation of the equivalence relation of two points being equivalent if they belong to the same orbit. All right, and so in this case, if we started with this original group action being free, then every connected component of uh, this graphing G sub S is just isomorphic uh, to the Cayley graph of gamma with respect to the generating set S. All right, and so uh, one way that treeings arise is that if you start with a free group on, that's freely generated by S, then G sub S is a treeing. What's that? Then? Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a treeing. I mean, it's it's a very it's the simplest example, but it's uh, you know these these G sub S is often what what happens is you start with this and then somehow modify them to something that's less algebraic and much more uh, you know, combinatorial and not necessarily just uh, coming just from the G sub S. But that's that's a good starting point. So uh, so I'll call a countable Borel equivalence relation treeable uh, if it admits a treeing. I guess I should say that everything I'll be saying today will be in the, in the measured category, so um, I try to remember to say that we, we only care about everything up, uh, up to null sets, but uh, that, that is indeed uh, the case, so maybe if I forget to say it, uh, I'll, I'll try to remember. So, 
So the equivalence relation is called treeable if it, treeable if it admits some treeing. Uh, and so a group gamma is called treeable if it, ha if it has, if there exists some free probability measure preserving action of gamma whose orbit equivalence relation is treeable. All right, so that's, uh, treeable is the existence of some action, free PMP action whose equivalence relation is treeable. So strongly treeable, uh, group being strongly treeable means that every free probability measure preserving action of that group uh, has a treeable orbit equivalence relation. And it's an open problem which uh, we're very far from being able to answer, uh, but the, the problem is whether all, are all treeable groups in fact strongly treeable. So examples of strongly treeable groups include uh, free groups. Um, the Ornstein-Weiss theorem implies that all amenable groups are treeable, in fact with the put a line structure on every, inf for an infinite amenable group, put a line structure. Uh, and well, you can, there's some closure properties. For instance, you can take amalgams of amenable groups over finite subgroups um, and some other sort of not, not too difficult closure properties. Um, all right, so things which are sort of a little more easily seen to be treeable, but maybe not easily seen wh whether they're strongly treeable, but part of this talk is, uh, will be about establishing their strong treeability. Uh, but surface groups uh, are treeable. Um, so uh, we'll see on the next slide uh, wh why that's the case. Uh, and then these well, finitely generated elementarily free groups were shown to be treeable uh, in a paper of Bryson, Tweedell, and Wilton. So those are finitely generated groups with the same first order theory as free groups. Um, so non-treeable groups, there's uh, uh, plenty of them. So a uh, paper of Adams and Spots here establishes that uh, infinite groups with property T are not treeable. Um, then there's arguments, uh, independent, I, I believe, arguments of, uh, I mean, they're very different in, in flavor. I'm not sure. Uh, I think that they were around the same time, and I believe they were independently shown by Gaboria and then Pimentel and Perez that uh, if you take a product group, G cross H with, with G non-amenable and H infinite, then the, the product is not uh, treeable. And uh, also, uh, so treeability passes to subgroups. So in fact, any group that contains a non-treeable subgroup will itself be not, not treeable. So any group containing a subgroup as above will, will be non-treeable. Yes? For strongly treeable? Uh, Sorry, so this is, I, maybe I missed, so how is it, what's the different from this? Um, ah, for, instead of amenable, for strongly treeable groups over a finite subgroup, so yeah, so this is a sort of closure property, that's, that's, that's fine, yeah. In some sense, if you just start with these, then you're, you're really, <laughs> you're not getting, of course, once you throw in more things, you'll, you'll, that, that closure prop property will become relevant, but at, at this point, there's not really much else. Uh, all right. So, all right, so it's a theorem of, of, of Greg Hjort that a group is treeable if and only if it's measure equi equivalent to a free group. Uh, so, and in fact, so we, we heard about measure equivalence in, in Camille's talk. Uh, so, there are four measure equivalence classes of free groups, and well, so one way to, to sort of say them is that these, the measure, measure equivalence uh, Classes of treeable groups are divided into these four classes according to uh, what's called their cost. So here I have a, a cheating definition of the cost of a, of a treeable group. It's cheating because the definition is implicitly, it's not the original definition of cost, it's implicitly invoking uh, a theorem of, of, of Gaborio. So here's the cheating, well, so it's, it works, it's a perfectly good definition, but uh, it's just sort of the, to, to save time. So <laughs> suppose uh, gamma is treeable so that we can find some free probability measure preserving action uh, whose orbit equivalence relation is treeable, and we fix a treeing T for the orbit equivalence relation. So then the cost of gamma is defined to be half the average degree of the treeing. All right, so it's a th this theorem of Gaborio uh, that is sort of justifying this, <laughs> that it makes a connection to the usual definition of cost. So there's a theorem of Gaborio that this value, uh, this cost, half the average degree, it's actually, it actually doesn't depend at all on which treeable action you take or on which treeing you take. So it's, it's just, 
gives you, it's just an invariant of the group itself, once you know your, your, your group is treeable. All right, and so here's a, a table of the four uh, measure equivalence classes or f of, of treeable groups. So, <clears throat> of course, you have the free group on zero generators, the trivial group. These are, uh, can be described as the treeable groups of cost strictly less than one. All right, and in fact, you can describe this uh, class of groups algebraically just the class of all finite groups. All right, then you have the measure equivalence class of the free group on one generator, so of Z. Uh, we can describe that in this cost point perspective as the, the class of all treeable groups of, of cost one. And group theoretically, that actually just corresponds to uh, the class of all infinite amenable groups. And then the two other uh, measure equivalence classes are a little bit more, more mysterious. So there's a class of the measure equivalence class of the free group on two generators, or really a, a, on any finite number of generators greater than or equal to two. And cost-wise, those are all the treeable groups of cost strictly between one and infinity. And, uh, well, and then the final class is the, the class of the measure equivalence class of the free group on countably infinite number of generators. And uh, those are just the treeable groups of cost, of infinite cost. And it's, it's an open problem whether there's, we can possibly have any group theoretical description of what this class is. I, the sort of thing that I'm thinking of would be saying that the, the class of treeable groups is the smallest class of uh, groups that contain, say, all amenable groups and that are closed under the following operations. That would be a really satisfying thing if someone could <laughs> find some more algebraic characterization of what it, what it means for groups to be treeable. But in fact, we're super far from being able to do anything like that. Uh, we really don't have, just the knowledge that a group is treeable, we don't, we can't extract any algebraic information really, uh, very little algebraic information that we can extract from that. We're very far from being able to actually say anything um, very explicit, like classifying, uh, giving this char characterization of these class of groups. So I just, I, it's, a, it's a nice long-term goal to have in mind. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so th this, these are uh, in the same measure equivalence class. The, the one will be a treeable group of cost two, and the other one will be a treeable cost three. They're, they're the same measure equivalence class. That's why I just cho chose a representative for the class, so this is F2. Just, yeah, finite number greater than uh, or equal to two. Uh, <clears throat> So, and maybe I'll also say, just speculating that, I mean, this, this question on the previous slide about whether are all treeable groups strongly treeable, my hunch is that no one's gonna be able to just show, my hunch would be, first of all, the answer would be yes, and secondly, um, the, uh, there would be no direct proof of this. The way to prove it would be to actually show that, the, give an algebraic description of the class of treeable groups and then observe that somehow that they're all strongly treeable. I don't, this is just in case anyone, you know, just giving my, my perspective on the way I think these things will end up going, but well, you can always be surprised, who knows. All right, so today I'll, I'll talk about, so all, all these groups that I had, I'll go back to this slide, all these groups that we have here that, are, that I listed here, that well, the surface groups and elementarily free groups, they were known to be treeable, uh, and maybe here I can point out. So the reason surface groups are treeable is because they're, they're measure equivalent to, to free groups. So uh, surface groups uh, and free groups are both lattices, uh, so like hyperbolic surfaces, are both lattices in the isometry group of the hyper hyperbolic plane, th those in free groups. So they're, they're both they're measure equivalent, uh, and so they are in fact treeable. Uh, all right, so what I'll talk about today is, is, is this theorem we'll, we'll, which will allow us to actually show that all those, those surface groups and the elementarily free groups uh, are in fact strongly treeable. So here's the, the first theorem. And so this has, our, our techniques have, are really built around uh, planarity and uh, planarity techniques. And so what we need to do is um, sort of, uh, as, as is often the case in, in, in when you're doing combinatorics in this measurable setting, is you need uh, to sometimes just inject the word Borel everywhere. Uh, so here, I'll inject the word Borel before uh, planner. 
So we, we, we give a definition in the paper of what it means for a, uh, a graphing to be Borel planar. So you want a sort of Bor Bor Borel witness to the planarity. And I'll, I'll explain what that means. Uh, but we show that uh, if we have a graphing of, of an equivalence relation that, that, is, that, is, that satisfies us, that is Borel planar, then in fact the equivalence relation is treeable. And not only that, but there's a, in fact a treeing of the equivalence relation uh, where, the, that's, where the edges come from that, that planar graph. So we can remove some edges from the planar graph, and, and, and what remains is actually a treeing of the equivalence relation. Uh, all right, so as a corollary to this, uh, we get that if uh, gamma is a group admitting a planar Cayley graph, then gamma is strongly treeable, uh, just like from these G sub S's, these were pasting the Cayley graph onto every orbit. Uh, so if you have a planar Cayley graph, then you have a planar graphing, and in fact, it will be Borel planar, and uh, the, this theorem applies, and we get that groups of planar Cayley graphs are strongly treeable. So this already gives us that surface groups, uh, and in fact, all lattices in the isometry group of the hyper hyperbolic plane uh, are strongly treeable. Uh, and so to, to handle elementarily free groups, we have to so there's a description of, of, of uh, algebraically of what elementarily free groups look like due to um, Sela and uh, Karlampovich and Miasnikov. Uh, so we sort of do a it's it's a, a slightly more general looking at a slightly more general construction. So we we end up getting looking at groups that uh, uh, even a larger class of groups than the elementarily free groups. Groups that uh, I'll give the definition uh, in, in a later slide. But uh, these are groups that are fundamental groups of what we call an IFL tower over a graph. So every fundamental group of an IFL tower over a graph is strongly treeable. And so this is how we get elementarily free groups and more because it's, it's, it's a larger class. So I'll explain all, all this now. So, uh, so the, combinatorially, the way we use planarity is through planar duality. So, uh, if G is a planar graph, so here I'm just going to talk now, not even in, uh, you don't even have to think about anything measurable, I'm just going to talk about just some combinatorics on, on, on just planar graphs in general. Uh, so let G be a planar graph, and we'll, we'll call G star the planar dual of G. So what that means is that the vertices of, of G star, oops, I'm sorry, the vertices of G star, uh, are these facial cycles in this uh, planar embedding. So in each of these, uh, the center of each of these faces, I put a red dot. Those, that's the, the vertices of the dual, so the red, the red uh, vertices. And then the edges the, are, are in green, uh, of the edges of the dual. So for each edge in, in the original graph that, uh, that is shared by two faces, we put a, a, a dual edge that connects the two red dots. So, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory just drawing the picture. You just put the dots, and then whenever there's an edge in the original graph that borders two uh, faces of uh, faces, then we put a dual edge there, right? So you can actually get multi multi multiple edges between the same. So it's really a multi-graph, and you can, that, that's, that's all fine. All right, so in order to get these treeings that are subgraphs of uh, sub Treeings of these planar, Borel planar graphings, we do uh, what we call an operation called cycloping, where we're going. What we're going to do is actually find some subgraph of the planar dual, and each edge in the planar in this in this subgraph, by definition, it crosses some edge in the original graph, and we're going to remove the edges uh, in in the original graph that cross the subgraph of, of the dual. So let me. This is this next slide on cycloping. So. <clears throat> If we have our planar graph G, G star is the, the planar dual graph, and then if we have any, given any subgraph G star naught of the dual, uh, we'll define the cyclope of G by G star naught, so using this, um, this symbol that indeed looks like a cyclops. Uh, so it, it's literally just remove every edge from E that crosses a, uh, whose, whose corresponding dual edge is in this subgraph. So here if I, here's a subgraph that I've drawn of, of the dual, and if we cycle away that sub subgraph, then we just get this graph on the right. All right, so we just remove the edges. So we might be left with some isolated vertices, uh, but fair enough. 
All right, and so uh, combinatorially, we can now say what corresponds to what, what properties of G naught would we have to have, or G naught star, I should say, what properties of G naught star must we have in order for G to the, the cyclope, once we cyclope it away, to, for, for what remains uh, to be tree of, uh, a treeing, or to be a tr uh, an acyclic graph with the same components. And it's not too difficult to convince yourself the following proposition that G, the, the cyclope graph, will be acyclic with the same connected components as the original graph if and only if G, G naught star is what we call a one ended spanning subforest of G star. So it's a spanning subgraph of, of the dual, so same vertex set, and every single component has, is, a, is a one ended tree. All right, so here I've drawn a one ended tree in green. That's what we think of as the dual. As, well, it's, as this is a, a component of G naught star. And if I have points X and Y, which I've drawn here in black, uh, that used to be connected in the original graph, that used to be connected by an edge, but now maybe that edge was cycloped away, and you might worry, well, why are they still connected in the, uh, in the cycloped graph? Graph. Well, that's because, because of this one-ended condition, we can actually follow sort of the outline of this dual graph backwards in the backwards direction, away from the end, and eventually, it might take a long time, but eventually we do get from X, a path from X to Y. So maybe for very concreteness, I'll go back to the previous slide. So if we look at, at, at these two vertices in the middle that used to be connected by an edge in the original graph, uh, now when I cyclope it away, now they're no longer connected, but I can still find a path between them by sort of tracing the outline and, and, and coming back. So that's the idea for why it's still connected. And the fact that um, each connected component of G naught star is uh, infinite, that tells us that we won't have any cycles remaining once we cycle a bit away, because if you have any cycle, well, that cycle, uh, any cycle in G, then that cycle is, is made up of a bunch of faces of, this, of, of, of G, G being this planar graph. And so take one of those faces is gonna be a vertex in the dual, and that, that vertex inside G naught star that face, I should say, being a vertex of G naught star, by assumption it has an infinite connected component G naught star, so actually there, we, it will, its component will, 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 will leave that cycle that we started with, and so you'll actually break every single cycle in the graph. So that's, if we go back over here, it's just, if we started with, with some, for instance, some, some cycle up here, with a compose that are just these two faces together. Well, you start at one face inside, and then you eventually leave the cycle, and once you leave, that means you've broken that edge, and so here, uh, that cycle doesn't exist anymore. Of course, over here, this is not a one-ended uh, subforest of the dual, so we're not actually getting uh, an acyclic graph in the end, but at least this is an example where one, one such cycle is broken, but as long as we have this condition, every cycle gets broken. So that's sort of just combinatorially a pretty straightforward proposition, but it's sort of the critical uh, combinatorics of what's going on. So the goal uh, is to find one ending, ended spanning subforests of the dual graph. And we want to do all this, now we're going to be in the measurable realm, so we need to do all this stuff in a measurable way. So, so to prove uh, our, uh, our theorem, the, this theorem one, that for a Borel planar graph, uh, okay, so what, I need to say what it means for the graphing to be Borel planar. So Borel planar, there are a few ways that you could imagine making the, it precise to have this Borel witness to planarity. Uh, in, in our case, one way to do it is that, uh, so planarity can be characterized in terms of the existence of a two basis, that means a collection of cycles in your graph, such that every edge in your graph is contained in at most two of, it, so that the cycles have to generate your, your, the cycle space, and every edge in your graph is contained at most two of, of those cycles in your generating set. That's called a two basis. And so then it makes perfect sense to, for a, when you're given a Borel graph uh, to ask whether a collection of cycles is Borel, so you can ask for a Borel two basis. And so that's uh, the, the working definition that we use for Borel planarity, and in, in all the cases and applications, we, this uh, you know, it's, it's not difficult to verify that when you would expect planarity, you in fact have Borel planarity. Uh, so for this proof, right, so we're given a Borel planar graphing G of R on X mu, and it's enough to find, once again, on a mu conal set, 
uh, Borel one-ended spanning subforest of the dual graph of the planar dual. So the dual, of course, is defined in this very um, uniform way. It's, it's, if, if your original graph was Borel planar, then this dual graph will be uh, a Borel graph on a standard Borel space as well. All right, so to find a one-ended spanning subforest of the dual, uh, we use, we use this lemma that, so if we start with, a, a, so this is the lemma that I, <laughs> that, that is actually where we critically use probability measure preserving. However, we have a, the proof, theorem one still holds even in the, in the measure class preserving case. Uh, we just have to use different arguments, but it's sort of, it's a, there's sort of a nice quick argument in the, in the probability measure preserving case using this lemma that if we have, uh, okay, I should say this lemma, it's open, we don't, we don't know uh, if there's an analog of this lemma. It's open whether there's an analog in, in, in full generality in the, in the measure class preserving setting. But okay, so in the PMP setting, that H be a PMP graphing on X mu of at least quadratic growth. All right, so every uh, connected component has at least quadratic growth. Then on a, on a mu conal set, uh, H has a Borel one ended spanning subforest. So we're applying this uh, to the H being the dual graph of G, we do get our uh, one ended spanning subforest. That lets us then cycle that away and get uh, our treeing that's contained in the original plan Borel planar graphing. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk now about what goes into now this, this IFL business. Uh, so these IFL stands for inductive free level towers. So, all right, so here's the setup. So we'll start with U, a connected CW complex. And sigma will be some connected compact surface with boundary uh, and such that its uh, fundamental group is free group on at least two generators. So that corresponds to the oil ca oiler characteristic being less than or equal to minus one. All right, so what we'll do, given that, that data, uh, we'll also pick a bunch of loops, these gamma, so we have the boundaries, uh, so sigma is a surface with, uh, with boundaries. We'll call the boundary components beta, the beta j's. And we'll pick a bunch of loops, gamma j's, inside of u of, uh, that represent infinite order elements of pi 1 of u. And we'll just glue beta, beta j to gamma j. All right, and so v will be the quotient space just after this gluing. All right, and so once we do this gluing, uh, we obtain the space v. And we say that v is I of IFL over u. And so for an IFL tower, it's just iterating this finitely many times. So if we have V0, V1 through Vn, these are spaces where each Vi plus 1 is IFL over Vi, then we say that Vn is uh, an IFL tower over V0. All right, so then it's a theorem of Sela, Kolompovich, uh, Miasnikov, and also uh, uh, it, it really wrapped up uh, in, in, all, all the uh, like extreme cases and sort of very presented very nicely in a paper of Guillardel, Levin, and uh, Sklinos that every finitely generated elementarily free group can be described as the fundamental group of an IFL tower over a graph. All right, so <clears throat> so the relevance here now for IFL towers, we're able to then uh, prove uh, this this theorem, which lets us uh, get strong treeability uh, for. Uh, for groups uh, that are IFL towers over a graph, or IFL towers over some, something whose fundamental group is already known to be strongly treeable. So if V is, v is IFL over U, then uh, the fundamental group of U, viewed as a subgroup of the fundamental group of V, is, is what we call a strong measure-free factor of pi 1 of V with treeable complement. So what that means is that if we're given some free probability measure-preserving action of pi 1 of V, then uh, we look at the equivalence relation, R sub pi 1 of V, that's generated by pi 1 of V. Uh, and that equivalence relation splits as a free product of the equivalence relation generated by pi 1 of U, together with some uh, free product of that with some treeable equivalence relation. So this is what we mean, treeable complement. This S will be treeable. And the equivalence relation generated by pi 1 of U is a free factor. Uh, <coughs> So this, lets you, this is the inductive step that lets you just show then that IFL towers over a graph are uh, indeed strongly treeable. So here's a picture of, of what's going on in the case of, so here we have this surface, one boundary component, sort of the simplest case uh, to think about, or one of the simplest cases to think about, this one boundary component, glue it onto beta, onto gamma. 
So then the fundamental group of sigma is just free on two generators. And then this boundary uh, component beta corresponds to the commutator. So if we call we use the usual A and B generators for a free group on two generators. Then this boundary component is the commutator with A and B. Say call it K. So that's in, in, in purple over here. And uh, <clears throat> all right, and so the, the resulting group pi 1 of v will split as a graph of groups, in this case, on two vert uh, well, on, it's always on two vertices, but the vertex groups will be, of course, pi 1 of u and pi 1 of, of, of the surface sigma, and then we'll have an edge for each boundary component. And uh, here you can see that we have this nice planar graph uh, that this, this will represent, um, well, right, so in, in the universal uh, cover of v, you're going to have, it's going to have this tree of spaces decomposition, and you'll have some, uh, some pieces that look like uh, this, this Cayley graph, uh, this, or this, uh, I should say, uh, this graph, well, we, we glue in, the, in these two cells as well, and, uh, and we'll also have, uh, those will be sort of vertices in this tree of spaces decomposition, but then there will also be a tree, uh, vertices corresponding to universal cover of U, and they'll be glued along uh, in this tree-like fashion uh, along these, uh, well, bi-infinite lines corresponding to these, uh, these Ks, right? So these, the, the, in purple. So here I've, unfortunately, when you, do, when you draw things like this in this more Euclidean way, uh, it maybe gets a little bit harder to see. I, don't, I did make an attempt to draw it uh, a, a little bit better. I don't know if it's, if it, if it's helpful. So here, uh, this is, uh, of course, in, in the hyperbolic plane. So here I've drawn just in the red and, and, and blue the, the Cayley graph of the free group. And then the purple, so I should say, I'm filling in the purple just corresponds to sort of the white space that, that's outside. So I, was try I think maybe I shouldn't have filled it in. But filling it in was to just to say that's, not, that's sort of this white space happening outside. Sort of the, the planar graph that we're looking at is really what's going on on the inside, so not the filled in purple. And uh, all right, so this is uh, so we have this, and then we'll have the planar dual. So when we draw this planar dual, uh, we'll get this dual graph, and then we want to find a one-ended spanning subforest, which I uh, I didn't draw that part, but that you can hopefully imagine. Um, let's see. So okay. All right, so. Uh, <clears throat> Our, our results, along with George's theorem, imply that the orbit equivalence relation of every free probability measure preserving action of a surface group of integer cost can be generated by a free action of a free group of the same cost. And so I, I'll mention one open problem which I really like, which is, which, uh, you know, it's sort of a, an, an obvious thing to ask after this. The open problem is whether if you have an orbit equivalence relation of a free probability measure preserving action of a free group, uh, can it always be generated by a free action of a surface group of the same co cost? So there's <laughs> one, I think, a cute way to put it. This was put in a, uh, that Yehuda Shalom uh, put it this way. The uh, question is, is it true that every treeable equivalence relation is surfaceable? So, uh, so I, like the, I like that problem. So in the remaining time, I also maybe will mention a couple other related results that are also uh, in the paper considering what are called uh, measure-free factors. Um, so let me go over here. Maybe I should turn on the, the light for I'll grab some chalk. Okay. I think okay. Yeah, that's, I think that's good. So <clears throat> Uh, so, I mean, you can take like free products, uh, the, the, the strongly tree of amenable groups, like it's, it's not really known beyond sort of the obvious e example. So this is sort of, yeah, the first, maybe the simplest example for which, it's, uh, for which we don't know the answer. Uh, so, so, All right, so when you have a, uh, an action 
or just a, a yeah, an, an, a free PMP action of, of some group gamma, then you might have a, a subgroup. So H is a subgroup of gamma, and we'll say that H is uh, is called a measure-free factor. So measure-free factor of F. So maybe I should put the quantifiers the other way. H is a measure-free factor of F if there exists some uh, free PMP action of gamma such that the equivalent situation generated by H is, is in fact a free factor of the equivalence relation generated by gamma. And uh, so essentially from, from what I've already described here, um, so all right, this, let me just point out, this doesn't at all imply that H is, not, is, a, is a free factor of gamma. Of course, if you have, you have the other implication, if H is in fact a group theoretical free factor of gamma, it will be a measure free factor. Ah, and then there's also the, the corresponding strong version. So H is a strong, measure free factor if, if, if it's true in every free PMP action of gamma. So if RH is a free factor of R gamma in every R gamma arising from a free PMP action of gamma. All right, so it's a result that I described. Uh, I guess it was originally uh, uh, shown by Damian that th this commutator, uh, the cyclic subgroup of the free group, say on two generators, so we have a free group on two generators, A and B, then uh, originally shown by Gaboriot that this commutator, A, B, A inverse, B inverse, the cyclic subgroup is a measure-free factor. So, of course, group theor theoretically, it's not a at all uh, a free factor, but it's a measure-free factor of the free group on two generators. Uh, and then it, it follows from what I've described over here that, I, in fact, from, from this paper, that uh, it's, in fact, a strong measure-free factor. Uh, but in fact, uh, we, we realized from this, uh, this IFL construction, uh, or slight modification of it, we can actually get uh, a, a, a lot more. Um, so I'll also, I should mention that um, there's a, a paper of Alonzo uh, finding some, not strong, but some measure-free factors of, of, free group, of free groups, or I should say cyclic, Measure-free factors of free groups, uh, for example, like a. Uh, uh, maybe I'll put, write it this way. Like uh, okay, a um, b to the n a inverse uh, b to the m. Things like this, right? For n. And I'm at least one. Things like this, uh, it, and it wasn't clear at all. First of all, how to how to if there's some planarity argument that can get this, but we did realize eventually there is, and 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 uh, I'll just describe this now. So in the IFL construction, we always said that we were uh, gluing all the boundary components, these beta j's, uh, of, of of the of the surface onto u, but we can also look at uh, almost the same uh, condition, but where now we are allowed to leave uh, some, some of the boundary components unglued. So we'll have some, uh, so I'll just look at an example. So here we have some u, maybe u is a circle, and then maybe we glue on some
some boundary, two of the boundary components, but leave this un unglued. Here's like beta 3, beta 2, and beta 1. And we do some gluing. Maybe this, this uh, glues on through uh, multiplication by m, and this would glue on maybe by multiplication by n. So what, another thing that we show is that in, if we do this kind of construction, then you can look at uh, this unglued boundary component, and inside All right, so that's completely general. So if we leave some uh, boundary components unglued, uh, then inside pi, the result, we'll call it v again, in pi 1 of v, uh, or I'll just put it this way, that the, the subgroup, the cyclic subgroup generated by a, a unglued beta j, so let beta j be an unglued boundary component of, sig of sigma. All right, then this cyclic subgroup inside of, in, 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 in pi 1 of v is a measure free, is a strong measure free factor. So for example, if you do this exact gluing right here, this we, we actually get the strong version of Alonzo's results. And in fact, what we get more generally is that if we take two elements of infinite order if in a free product, uh, I guess maybe, all right, there's two, two parts. So first, that if, um, all right, so if G and H in gamma, so here gamma is any countable group, and if you have any G and H of infinite order, or infinite order, then uh, the cyclic subgroup generated by, or I should say, in the free product of gamma with uh, infinite cyclic group, let's say, is generated by T. So in this free product, so this is infinite cyclic. In this free product, um, the cyclic subgroup generated by G, T, H, T inverse is a, free, is a strong measure of free factor. Right. And then the second is that, in general, in uh, uh, any free product group, G free product H, if we take a group element in G of infinite order and a group element little h in capital H of infinite order, infinite order, uh, then the cyclic subgroup generated by GH is a strong measure free factor all right, of gamma, where gamma of the free product. All right, so that's, uh, that's the other corollary. So I'll, I'll end there. Thanks very much.